Welcome, everyone, to the latest edition of our Reimagined podcast series. Today with Tom Waldron from Super Turbo. Thanks, Tom, for your time and joining me today. Um, maybe to start out with, explain what your responsibilities are and certainly explain probably to many of our listeners and viewers, what is Super Turbo and what do you guys do? Sure. So I'm the executive vice president at Super Turbo. Um, nice nebulous title, uh, but what it really means is I'm in charge of our global business development and I'm primary touch point for the OEMs we work with. I also represent our company at the consortiums that we're members of, like the Southwest Research uh, Chetty Group or Mika, and I also do a lot of our global outreach at uh, events and uh, a lot of conferences. Too. Um, ten to the second part of your question, uh, what is Super Turbo? Um, so a little background, uh, we are a spin-out company from Woodward, and the whole concept of what we make came from a, a supplier and OEM meeting where the OEM asked for a preferred technique of controlling air for the engine. So this individual OEM said, look, we've got fuel injection down, but precise air control is something that would be of large value to us. So the idea was born, what if we could control a turbocharger and transfer power in both ways um, and basically hold the speed and respond to an engine request for air all the time? So the concept was born of let's put a fixed ratio planetary on the turbo, which is difficult to do. I mean, turbos are, especially in the commercial engines we, we work on, they're operating, you know, 120,000 RPM. So transferring power to and from something like that is, is not trivial. So being able to develop a, a fixed ratio planetary traction drive that captures the turbo is, you know, something that's taken us, you know, a decade to perfect. Mm -hmm. um, but it's pretty bulletproof at this point. But once you've taken the turbo and you've captured it, then you've reduced the speed, then you can put in a variable component. So electrical or mechanical, uh, our customers prefer the mechanical choice because it doesn't force an architectural change on them. Um, mm -hmm. So we use a, a continuously variable transmission, which is a tilted axis ball. It's a very compact design, but that allows you to vary the ratio of the device and effectively vary the ratio between turbo speed and crankshaft speed and thus demand or control airflow to the engine all the time. So what's nice about it is while you're controlling the turbo, it will naturally behave as a supercharger, a turbocharger, or a turbo compounder, depending upon the balance of power between the compressor side and the turbine side. So We've been able to take three independent technologies and put them into one package, um, but fundamentally at, at the heart of the of the device, it's an on-demander system. Okay, interesting. So, sounds complicated. Uh, <laughs> before I go there, maybe right away, some of our listeners will say this is this is cool stuff. Uh, probably will say too interesting. Again, combining different technologies into one, but the question might be. Why now? Why now when everybody's talking about we're going to fuel cell based vehicles, we're going to electric vehicles for for anything. Why do you believe now is still the right time or now maybe is the best time to come up and come with this technology to the market? Sure. So our company exclusively works in the commercial space. So the hard to electrify space. So we're talking class eight on highway large construction equipment. So the places where battery electric doesn't necessarily fit, especially from a return on investment aspect. So you fleets that don't want to electrify their warehouses, their distribution centers, their supply chains, um, or construction sites where electrification, the amount of time equipment has to be working. Um, that's the space that we operate in. We're, we're not fooling ourselves that this is an automotive application. Um, and why now? I think the emergence of hydrogen has really um, 
thrust our technology into a new a new arena. So mm-hmm. traditionally, what we've made is for advanced diesel with a focus on transient response, engine downsizing, ultra low NOx for diesel applications. But as hydrogen combustion has become, you know, the topic in the commercial space, the what we've built for diesel can be directly applied to hydrogen going forward. So now we're in the decarbonization world um, instead of just emission reduction and efficiency improvement. Now it's a decarbonization play. Um, and there, I think if you watch the world stage, uh, I, I'm, I would struggle to name an, an OEM, an engine manufacturer, that is not working on hydrogen combustion. So um, that has become a large focus for us. We still work with uh, customers on advanced diesel, but hydrogen is, is the new arena. Hydrogen, a new arena. Yeah, I just want to guess. So you're, you're talking hydrogen engines, obviously, here. Um, Correct. Tell me a little bit about it from a from a performance perspective. What do you see on, on hydrogen engines? Is it, hey, they need super turbo technology to really get it there, to be comparable? Um, from a, from an emissions, clearly depends if it's green hydrogen, is it not green hydrogen? But, but talk a little bit about... You know what? Again, you you always find in the on the internet or anywhere, right? You always find uh, everybody that has pros and everybody that has cons about any new technology. Mm-hmm. But share a little bit from your perspective. What do you see from a performance base, and just compare it to a traditional engine, and and maybe even to electrified? Because again, as you said, many areas today, at least, and maybe for the next five, potentially ten years, not ready for to be electrified. And hydrogen certainly can be this this bridge to, to, to fill that gap or overcome that gap, but possibly also be the future for a long time for many different industries. So share a little bit performance, emissions, all of these things. Sure. So maybe we'll put the fuel cell battery electric versus engine to the side for a minute. We'll talk about, you know, the engine approach. Okay. So um, the predominant path for hydrogen engines right now is – is a lean burn strategy. So you see that in uh, port fuel injected or MPI or in low pressure direct injected. Um, These engines are required to run very lean. And the reason that they have to is NOx. So we're talking, you know, lambda two or higher in order to move NOx down. And if you look at Euro 7, or the EPA or the California Air Resource Board, um, these future regulations have very stringent NOx requirements that we that the industry is going to have to meet if they want to keep running engines. So when you have an engine, you know, that's running two plus X stoichiometric and there's a fundamental balance always for the air system, for a turbo system, of what is available on the exhaust versus what are you asking the compressor to do. So it really rears its head in the dynamic space. So when you start driving a vehicle, going through gear shifts, you know, doing transient accelerations, running the WHTC or the FTP or the NRTC, um, what you see on hydrogen is you can't hold dynamic lean burn with just exhaust power alone. So you need to supplement from somewhere to hold that lean burn. So Mm -hmm. the technology we've developed um, as a mechanically driven turbo and on-demand air system, that's fundamentally what it's designed to do. It will hold whatever air fuel ratio, whatever lambda value you want all the time. So for hydrogen, what it's doing is it's removing compromise. Um, uh, a normal turbocharger on a hydrogen engine, you're going to have to, if there's not sufficient exhaust power to accelerate the turbo, and, you know, everybody in diesel is used to smoke limiters. But for hydrogen, you now have a NOx limiter, right? So, and it's all based on a lambda target that you have to follow through a dynamic cycle, the same mm-hmm. way you had to follow a smoke limiter in the past, and that would limit your acceleration. But for hydrogen, it's really tough. Um, If you want to hold lambda 2.4, you need to feed the compressor to hold that. So um, on hydrogen, we can constantly follow 
a lean burn dynamically. And what's really interesting is, you know, that obviously fixes the NOx problem right away, but it also fundamentally fixes the transient problem. So you're not balancing NOx versus, versus you know, torque rise or BMEP rise. You can now get fast diesel-like transient response while holding lean burn and holding NOx low. The extra effect is if you can hold the design lean burn, so the combustion is designed around, you know, a certain air fuel ratio where it's optimal. So if you can hold lean burn, your closed cycle efficiency is better. So we've learned working on diesel through the years, we are a turbo compounder, but you never want to sacrifice in cylinder efficiency. Closed cycle efficiency is king. So holding the right airflow is going to be an efficiency gain too. So when we look at an air system for hydrogen with the you know, specific demanding requirements for these heavy lean burn engines, if you can hold the lean burn and you can do it by borrowing some crankshaft power to assist what is already in the exhaust, mm-hmm. then you can, you can dynamically knock the knocks out. You can improve the drivability and you can improve the efficiency. So it's kind of like a, a one fix all for hydrogen in terms of emissions, efficiency, performance. It, it, it checks all the blocks. Um, and then of course you look at the super turbo and you say, well, that's more expensive than a wastegate turbo. That's more expensive than a fixed geometry or a VGT. Sure. And yeah, it is. Um, but for hydrogen, the dynamic shifts where, if you invest a little bit in the air side and you can dynamically hold lean burn, then you can decontent the rest of your architecture, uh, specifically the after treatment. So if you can keep NOx low, you know, we can go to a single small SCR and we don't need light off SCRs, electrically heated catalysts, no dual dosing, heated dosing. You can decontent the after treatment and, and actually save overall money for the whole system. Uh-huh. Sorry, that was a really long answer. No, so, it's very, yeah. it's very good. Cause I mean, one, one of my questions would have been, you know, <clears throat> I would say for every, for every technology that's in the field, right? Batteries, um, ADAS systems, infotainment, anything and everything in the mobility space, there are always to one or the other degree, when you look at it from a complete system, compromises right and i think you've, you've you've alluded already or explained some of those things and where you have one compromise but then there's always a benefit for something else and i think you've talked about this already unless there's something specific you you'd like to mention what what some people may perceive is, is a compromise going to a hydrogen engine as as a whole or going to a to a to a component like the the super turbo you're you're talking about I think you've explained this, but I want to make sure we're really kind of looking at these challenges and again, always opposing views and everything that I that I kind of want to highlight here, but also give you from from your point of view the chance to to kind of address, right? Anything else you want to mention of this? Sure. Um, and we would never pretend that like the only solution, like hydrogen engines, will never exist without super turbo. Uh, of course, <laughs> they can and will, right? Um, and it, it's. There are a lot of ways to approach the problem. So you can approach the problem through increasing displacement. And if you increase displacement, you can lower BMEP and you can, you know, partially fix transient response through, you know, just pure displacement increase and a BMEP drop. You can also, if it's acceptable for your customer base, you can have a slower transient response. So Maybe a truck that does a five-second transient versus a two-second transient is something that you could market. Um, but that's up to you know the OEM and the vehicle manufacturers of, of what's acceptable. Um, so you can you can run through the trade-offs of displacement versus the boosting architecture that you're comfortable with. Um, you know, an engine that doesn't respond as quickly. But when these engines get into vehicles. And there's an expectation of the diesel that it replaces. You know, you have to be a little bit careful with how far you can go on the compromises that that you're applying. And then for the air system architecture, there's other ways to attack it versus super turbo. 
So you could do eTurbo. Um, our system is effectively the same as an eTurbo. It's just a mechanical approach. Um, but for hydrogen, what we're seeing is, you know, 35 plus kilowatts of required power to hold this lean burn. So in the electric space, you're now talking high voltage. And the expense that comes with, you know, high voltage, you know, hybridization of your vehicle architecture. So are you willing to accept the power electronics, the necessary battery buffer or even battery storage um, and all the associated things that come with adding high voltage? I mean, there's even safety concerns for for the fleets out there once you put on 350 to 800 volts of electrical power. Um, mm. You can attack it through uh, mild hybridization, through 48-volt electrification. So you could look at a combination of a 48-volt, 10-kilowatt e-booster, you know, coupled with a secondary fixed geometry turbo. And then if you have 48-volt architecture on board, you can add stuff like electric heat and catalysts. And you can put together a system that attacks the compromise um, electrically. But... Mm -hmm. You're also adding a lot of expense as you walk down this electric path. Um, mm. So do you have the space? Do you have the budget? Um, it, the complexity starts to rise. Whereas it, we're offering a mechanical solution that OEMs should feel comfortable with because we communicate to the engine like a VGT. So it's J1939 CAN bus. You're just, the engine is just asking for the air. And, you know, calibration engineers who are used to controlling VGTs to chase an air target, they can do the same thing with our system. So it's, it's not, like, difficult to integrate versus an architectural change where you have sure. to do a lot of shipping. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Well, Tom, w would it be fair to say that when, when you guys first started, right, years ago, that you kind of highlighted a little bit where you guys came out of, the main focus was on on diesel engines, and and that has now shifted to to hydrogen, as you shared before. Is that fair to say? A lot of our, I mean, to be honest, all of the R and D money in their industry it's in hydrogen right now. So new technology but integration. When you started, I'm saying, when you started, was it mainly focused? Your product mainly focused with a target market for diesel engines, or did you already think, hey? Hydrogen is coming. We got to prepare it. Yes, diesel is a market, but we really ultimately already at back then when you guys started looked at hydrogen as really the the target approach. To be honest, hydrogen was not on the radar up until like three years ago, and right. we were we we're diesel centric. Um, like this fall at the ASME uh, Internal Combustion Engine Forward Conference, you'll see uh, published our latest program with Caterpillar which is a diesel-based engine downsize. So we're, we're still very active in diesel. Um, sure. The product was designed fundamentally to help advance diesel, you know, meet new regulation requirements. But I mean, by, by how you might call it luck, the, 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 I always say explosion of hydrogen. That's the wrong term to use with hydrogen, right? But um that coming onto the onto the onto the market has been great for what we do because you just take what we built for diesel and it fundamentally fixes so many problems with hydrogen yeah. right out of the box. And we're not creating this from a napkin. You know, it's not like let's design this from scratch. This is something you know we're running the DVP with AVL right now. We have a production partner already in place. Like the right. technology is mature. And right. it will be available on the timeline that OEMs require for, for hydrogen. But we're not – I think most people in the industry will tell you diesel is not going away. You know, It's not going to drop off a cliff in the near right. future for commercial engines. So we're going to continue to work on the diesel product. But hydrogen has just created a new value proposition, a whole new market for us. Sure, sure. And maybe the last question, Tom, and please feel free to add to it. What what do you see as the major, I won't say necessarily last, but the major hurdle maybe that we still have or that we're going to have as it relates to adoption of, of hydrogen engines on, on a large scale? Certainly, let's say class, 
maybe six on up, but certainly class eight. What, what do you personally see with all the involvement you guys have, with all the discussions I'm sure you have, not only with the engine manufacturers, but also with the, with the OEMs, which gives you a unique, I think, perspective, similar to, to ours, right? Working with all of them in the different technology fields. But interested to hear from you, what, what is it that you see as still the, the, the remaining hurdle? And I don't want to necessarily talk infrastructure. Uh, let's leave infrastructure aside. I think that's always something everybody talks about, which is very true and is a big one. But but outside of that, can you maybe on your final thoughts here, put a little bit of light on them? Sure. Well, of course, when as soon as you started talking, I was thinking infrastructure, which is a big <laughs> one. So um, like... If you look in, in the United States, the, the Inflation Reduction Act with the tax incentives or yep. the infrastructure bill with the hydrogen hubs. So we think the production side of hydrogen is, is coming. And, yep. you know, Europe has given real favorable classifications to hydrogen engines moving forward sure. for commercial to, like, encourage their uptake. Um, but on the technical side – we're all running as fast as we can. So combustion stability, um, hydrogen embrittlement, like we, we're we all more comfortable that engines, the durability aspect is a pretty known quantity, especially when compared to fuel cell or battery mm-hmm. electric for like a million mile type of or a 1.6 million kilometer vehicle. Um, but there's, there's hurdles that we collectively need to get through um, on – working with hydrogen as a fuel. So it's a small molecule, um, the smallest, right? So it will go everywhere, right? So crankcase ventilation, which most people want to feed into the turbo inlet, into the compressor. Um, So everybody in the turbo industry has got to deal with that. So um, there's still a lot of fundamental science between the combustion, the materials, like Things that we're all super comfortable with on on diesel have to be solved. The good thing is we're at a great starting point. I mean, internal combustion engines, there are a lot of us out there that know these engines really well, right? There's a lot of expertise. Maybe not so many kids graduated from college right now that are moving into <laughs> internal combustion. So That's a good point. maybe those yeah. of us who yeah, those of us who know how to work on them, maybe we're more valuable every day. Um it could be. But yeah, so there's there's definitely those types of challenges that, you know, suppliers and OEMs, we all have to, you know, work through. The good thing is what we're seeing is the industry is rowing in the same direction. So like we're doing a demo truck here in the United States and you see a lot of OEMs, a lot of oil and gas companies, a lot of suppliers who naturally would be competitors all getting in and working together. And we're like, let's build this truck. Let's take it to Washington, D.C. Let's show them we can decarbonize right now. And efforts like this around the planet are happening. So it's it's a unique environment, whereas diesel, it's like, who has the better solution? And hydrogen is like, okay, this is the path. Let's all work together to show it's the path. And there's a lot more collaboration than than I've seen in the past on on hydrogen as a topic. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point to collaboration, right? I mean, we see this in the mobility space, certainly on the new technologies, way more than what we've ever seen. Um, It will be interesting to see if that continues or if that's more a sort of a, a temporary thing to get us over that hump. And then we go back to our own keep our secrets close to our chest because it gives us a competitive advantage Mm -hmm. or moving more into this much more collaborative approach that I personally experience much more in a, in a, in a, in a, in a startup world with, with many California technology companies that sort of lift on from the beginning on this collaboration. I think that's a, that's a great thought to end it here. Tom, thank you very much for your time. Very insightful. Can't say I understood everything you talked about on the technology side, um, but I know our listeners would definitely uh, appreciate that, and I certainly learned a lot here, and I think they will as well. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, good luck to you guys. Yep, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Reimagine Mobility Podcast. If you liked this episode, please subscribe and tell a friend.